So hi everybody and welcome to those of you who are joining us um, live this evening. Um, you're very welcome as are uh, all of you who might be watching this after the fact on, on YouTube or one of our social media channels. So um, welcome to tonight's webinar on the ethics of transplantation. My name is Jan Shorrock and I am executive officer for a charity called Kidney Kidney who's organised tonight's event. Um, for those of you who don't know me or perhaps are less familiar with the charity, uh, Give a Kidney is an organisation based in the UK and we aim to raise awareness of uh, living donation, particularly non-directed living kidney donation. So when somebody steps forward to donate a kidney, um, very much like donating blood to somebody they don't know and, and may never meet who's on the transplant waiting list. Um, so we were set up to raise awareness of uh, living kidney donation uh, to support donors going through that process for those who have been through that process and also to kind of advocate for positive change for the donor journey. Um, so obviously living donation in and of itself has been an ethical issue in transplantation. Uh, the idea that somebody um, could go through a surgery that they don't need and gives them no physical benefit themselves um, for the benefit of somebody else kind of creates its own challenges and I think 20 years ago the idea that somebody might do that for a stranger was, you know, a topic of great debate. Um, and obviously since then, that's become much more business as usual, certainly in the UK, although not in every country around the world. Um, so we're going to hear from um, four fantastic speakers. We've got some uh, real experts joining us this evening, and I'm really grateful to all of them for, for joining us. I'm sure they're going to be um, offering some very thought provoking uh, content for us today and some challenge uh, for us to all think about. Um, thank you to Annabelle Bennett, who is my colleague at Give a Kidney, who's kind of set up today and done all the legwork bringing this, this panel together. So really appreciate all of you being here and um, to Annabelle for setting it up. Um, so we'll be joined today by uh, Adnan Sharif, uh, Miran Epstein, Greg Morlock and Antonia Croning. Um, they'll introduce themselves as each of them speak. And the format for today is um, they'll each have about 10 minutes to talk about some of the issues that they feel are kind of the key ethical issues in transplantation currently. Um, and then there'll be some space afterwards for discussion. We can also take questions from uh, those of you who are joining us live. Um, the Q&A uh, facility is, uh, is, is available to you. So if you just... Uh, but for those of you on a tablet or a screen, if you just either tap your screen or scroll to the bottom, the Q&A box where hopefully you'll be able to type in your questions as we go and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can. We may not get to them all, but we're very happy to um, invite the speakers to respond to, to some of those tonight. And if you have any burning issues following today, uh, do let us know and we can also perhaps contact them after to see whether they can give their perspective we don't manage to get to you this evening. Um, I think that's probably everything from me just at the moment. Um, so I'm going to hand over firstly to Greg. Um, he's going to introduce himself. And, and thank you, Greg. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you to the organisers for inviting me to, to talk tonight. Uh, I like talking about ethics, and particularly about transplant ethics, so uh, this is always something that is enjoyable for me. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm an Associate Professor at Warwick Medical School, uh, where I am Academic Lead for Law and Ethics Teaching. Uh, and academic lead for year one of Warwick's MBCHB degree, uh, which is uh, taking up most of my time at the moment. So I'm having less time to think about transplant stuff, uh, but yes, yeah, nice to be doing it tonight. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what I've identified as being two key areas of, of ethical concern in relation to living donation. Uh, the first of which uh, is no doubt going to, well, in fact, I think they're both reasonably familiar uh, to many of us. Uh, those of you with, with a keen interest in uh, organ donation and transplantation will no doubt have considered some of these aspects um, already. Uh, but I think it, it's worth raising them because I think that from my perspective, as someone who's interested in ethics, these are, are two of the, the key issues at the moment. So the first one that I want to discuss um, is 
the role of social media uh, in organ donation and how it is making everybody, uh, everyone in society, more connected and how it is changing uh, the way that organ donation can potentially take place. Um, so there's been a fair bit of work done on this, um, but I still think that social media is something that is not fully under control within transplantation. It's got the potential to do a lot of good, but broadly speaking, people seem to be left to their own devices to use social media as they wish, uh, rather than anything being more centralised and controlled uh, in relation to organ donation. So um, I think... <laughs> Fundamentally, um, it has connected people who may not previously have been connected. It's made the world a smaller place. It's changed the nature of friendships. Uh, it's changed how we actually meet people. There are people who I would now consider to be friends who I've met online, but have never met in person. And I guess that the COVID pandemic has probably accentuated uh, this type of thing as well. So one of the impacts that it's had in relation to organ donation and transplantation is that if someone needs a kidney transplant, for instance, they can now set up a Facebook page uh, and they can effectively campaign to find a donor for themselves, which is fantastic from some um, perspectives because it allows people to take control of their own situation uh, and to actively take steps to try to improve it. Uh, and that seems to be the sort of empowering thing uh, that social media is particularly good at. But I think there are some potential downsides to this, uh, and these have been explored in the ethics literature, but I don't know that transplantation has fully got to grips with, with handling some of these issues um, completely, at least. Um, so the risks that arise from the use of social media and people using these sorts of um, campaigns to find living donors for themselves, well, one of the, the ones that's been raised a lot in the literature is the prospect of what's known as a beauty contest dynamic. The idea that those who are most appealing, however we define that, becoming more likely to find uh, people who are willing to donate to them. So when I've looked at uh, a lot of these sorts of pages in the past, people describe themselves in certain ways. Uh, and I would say that some of it's slightly surprising. It's amazing how many people who uh, are trying to find a living kidney donor um, are um, doing lots of charity work. Uh, working in amazingly um, sort of altruistic careers, regular churchgoers. Some of them are portraying themselves as borderline saints, it has to be said. Um, now, far be it from me to suggest that these aren't completely honest, but I think that people have um, a motivation and incentive to describe themselves in particular ways. Uh, and there are potential issues with this. Normally, we would hope that kidneys would be allocated according to reasonably objective criteria so that those with the greatest need um, actually have the greatest likelihood uh, of receiving a kidney first. So those with the greatest urgency, perhaps. But when it comes to other factors being introduced, well, maybe now we're going to have the most beautiful people receiving kidneys ahead of people who are less visually appealing. We're going to have people in particular careers, uh, people uh, who are members of particular faiths or, or churches, suddenly we're introducing non-medical criteria into allocation of medical resources. And this obviously happens uh, a lot in living donation anyway. Uh, but when we're talking about the use of social media, well, it seems to add an increased risk of this happening uh, and it may potentially create an undesirable, undesirable dynamic. Um, I think another issue related to this is that on social media, relationships are often formed quickly. If we think about traditional, in inverted comma, living related um, donation, it will often be between close family members uh, donating to a relative, um, or at least there, there may well be a pre-existing relationship there. I'm, I'm setting aside non-directed donation for now. Um, in that type of situation, that relationship is likely to be of reasonable long-standing. There will be an understanding there about the nature of that relationship, and it will have existed prior to the need for a kidney. When we're talking about relationships that have been formed solely for the basis of kidney donation online, well, actually, some fundamental things are likely to be lacking. There's a greater reliance on rapidly formed trust uh, rather than actually the history of a relationship. 
And what we may see is that relationships change once a kidney has been donated. Suddenly a donor might potentially expect something back um, as, a, as a result of their donation. So there's an increased risk of some level of exploitation going on. Now, I'm sure that there are people here today who are a better place than me to, to speak to their experiences of how often this happens. Uh, but I think it has to be highlighted as a risk. The other issue with social media, which I think will probably relate to some of the the other ethical issues which will be discussed tonight, is that it does give a, a sort of pathway to a potentially quite a murky underworld. So when I joined Facebook groups about organ donation um, a, a few years ago now, probably four or five years ago, uh, within one hour of me joining uh, a particular Facebook group, someone in India had offered to sell me a kidney and it seemed to be a pretty serious offer. Now, obviously, I didn't need a kidney, so this wasn't something that was appealing to me. But people in different situations may obviously view this quite differently. Uh, and there's a potential that this can then feed into things like uh, transplant tourism, potentially even illegal organ trafficking. Uh, and this takes place largely behind closed doors. Uh, social media, particularly today's social media, tends to be quite highly encrypted and inaccessible to many people. So... I think that there are potentially some risks here. These have to be considered against the benefits, and there are huge benefits of using social media in relation to organ donation, but I think that they do need to be considered. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about um, is how or to what extent um, living donation should be something that is promoted and encouraged. Uh, now, obviously, give a kidney, have a particular stance on uh, non-directed, um, kidney donation and are aiming to raise awareness of it. But what we're starting to see now is from some organisations um, more than just awareness raising and sometimes promotion, genuine promotion, even encouragement of, of living donation. And I think for some organisations to do that, that's absolutely fine. But what we may want to consider is whether it's ethically appropriate for doctors or members of the healthcare profession to promote living donation to this extent. Now, the reason that this concern arises is that although living donation is low risk, it's considered to be by many people an acceptably low risk, there are still some risks involved. You take a healthy person and you turn them into a patient for the benefit primarily of somebody else. Now, allowing this to happen is one thing, but actively promoting it trying to encourage people to become living donors, trying to encourage people to undertake what could, could be considered a risky behavior. That's another step. And we've seen transplant organizations being fairly reluctant to take this step in the past. But I think now with various transplant strategies that have been released over the last few years, we are seeing or starting to see the genuine promotion of living donation is being placed um, as a higher priority. I think this is quite a big shift in transplantation uh, and I think that it is happening without everyone being entirely conscious of it. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's, it's an unacceptable shift, but I think that there is a discussion to be had about whether living donation like this should be promoted, where the limits lie and how living donation should sit alongside deceased donation programs. Um, I think that's all I need to say for now. Uh, so I will pass over to Miran. But obviously, I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, as the session goes on. Thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm Miran Epstein. I teach uh, medical ethics and law at Bath and the London School of Medicine, Queen Mary University of uh, London. Um, uh, and have been uh, writing a lot and publishing a lot on uh, transplant ethics. Um, there is uh, basically um, one issue I would like uh, to raise uh, this evening, um, which relates to uh, not so much an ethical question, but a, a sociological question, rather a question about how did we come to this situation? The situation at the moment where um, uh, uh, trade in organs is uh, considered uh, all over the world almost uh, illegal, um, 
Uh, and uh, this is against all, all logic, and I would like to explain why. Uh, before I do that, I would like to uh, try to correct uh, some misunderstanding about uh, uh, the criticism uh, against uh, uh, trading organs. Uh, the criticism is, is, is based on, uh, on, on three elements, two of them, or three points. Uh, two of them are ethical, one of them is technical, question of feasibility. Um, there is a common belief that uh, trade in organs, uh, in principle, interferes with the validity of consent, the consent of the donor, or the consent of the vendor in this case. So first of all, I would like to uh, stress that this is absolutely wrong. Um, I, of course, trading organs can be done unethically, that is without consent, and it sometimes involves, you know, just robbery of organs, robbery of kidneys mainly. Uh, but there's no necessity. There, it's not necessary that this happens. The point I, I wish to make is that uh, trade in organs can be done uh, with the consent of the vendor, uh, without violating the validity of the consent. But this does not mean that it is free. It just means that the, the, the consent is valid. The consent is legal. It doesn't mean that it's free. Underlying, and this is a basic assumption which I'm not even willing to defend, underlying all trade in organs, there is some form of coercion, usually economic coercion, uh, in the background. And this economic coercion is not detected by the procedure or the process of consent. And it says a lot about consent. You know, if consent can validate or can legitimize trade in organs, then what is consent really good for? I think it's an important point. Uh, but the point is that in principle, trade in organs does not, in essence, it does not violate the consent of the vendors. And even in the black market, in most cases, vendors give consent. Obviously, they sell their organs with consent. It's not free consent, but that only says something about the nature or the manipulative or the coercive potential uh, of, of consent. This takes me to uh, the point I wanted to, uh, to stress. Um, the point is uh, that um, all kind of, you know, reason would leave, uh, would, would lead us uh, to, or could lead us to the belief that at some point in the history of organ transplantation, organ donation, um, trade in organs would become ethical, would become acceptable, would become normal. Why do I say that? I am saying that because um, trade in everything becomes normal. In a capitalist society, everything is sellable, including the body. We do it in what I call the nine to five tragedy. You know, we sell our labor power in the market. In medicine, we have precedents where we, you know, have been already kind of, you know, selling parts of our bodies, so commercial surrogacy, and um, uh, uh, taking payment for participation in clinical trials and selling um, uh, blood uh, and, and uh, uh, selling uh, genetic material, uh, sperm and, and eggs. Uh, I mean, uh, if this is the case, why uh, hasn't trade in organs become ethical, become legal in our system? It could have. And this takes me to 2008, uh, where um, the transplant community and other organizations from all over the world convened in Istanbul, uh, attempting to um, cope 
um, and and kind of stop and prevent a, a an emerging crisis uh, uh, involving trade in organs. But it wasn't the principle of trade in organs. It was the fact that um, uh, uh, at the black market, a black market in organs, obviously involving trade, but that's a secondary point, a black market in organs was uh, threatening the economic future and the economic presence, indeed, of the uh, of many um, uh, transplant sent, uh, uh, transplant practices in the West. Uh, in the third world, which is, you know, the biggest hub of potential vendors, um, uh, you know, these uh, markets uh, in organs and uh, markets in transplantation have uh, evolved, and these were attracting patients from the West, uh, leaving the transplant centers in the West idle. Um, I... Uh, witnessed this as the most important problem, or that this was the problem and not the principle of trade in organs, uh, uh, which the West had to deal with. And indeed, in Istanbul, there were two groups of, uh, of campaigners, those who were against all trade in organs, that is against black market in organs, as well as against any regulated market, and those who were only against a black uh, market in organs taking our patients, but not against a market in organs, a regulated one in the West. Uh, it happens to be the case that uh, those who were in favor of a regulated market in the West uh, were the minority in the room. And the result was that um, uh, those who were uh, against all kinds of transplant um, uh, commercialism or trade in organs, they took the lead. They took the lead, and uh, but, but they had to um, turn to um, medical leaders all over the world, ministers of um, health all over the world and convince them that there is no need to and there's no reason to uh, uh, legalize trade in organs because uh, that, uh, not because of any kind of, you know, uh, uh, moral reason, uh, countries had, you know, states had no problem with and still have no problem with trade in organ, uh, organs as a principle. Uh, many states, by the way, you know, capitalized on the black market, sending their patients, you know, just to get a kidney, you know, uh, somewhere, um, basically in the east and the south of the world, uh, and then, you know, just uh, uh, leave the, the waiting list. Um, but they convinced uh, this majority in the room in Istanbul, convinced uh, the world uh, um, health uh, ministers um, that they, that we, all of us, could reach an equilibrium with the black market, a situation wherein we try a little bit harder to uh, have to supply our own organs via so-called altruistic routes in the West, um, reducing the need for patients to buy organs illegally in other countries by a little, not by much, introducing what we now call as unrelated living donation, which as Greg intimated, might turn out to be a legal fiction concealing trade in organs uh, and introducing uh, um, a, a host of other um, uh, uh, promoting strategies uh, that would create a situation that does not 
force us, does not force the system to go, uh, to go market, to, um, uh, uh, to uh, legalize trade in organs. Um, I would like to make only one last point, and this is that um, uh, regulation of the market in the West um, would have cost the states a lot more than the situation at the moment. Now the majority of organs are received or harvested or retrieved for free, okay? And people like getting things for free. Uh, now, uh, this is the situation. It doesn't mean it's going to stay so, uh, but um, I would like to suggest that even those who are very much in favor of uh, trade, of legalizing trade in organs, now realize that they can live with a system that does not provide everything, but still provides sufficient organs to sustain the transplant practices in the West. I will now pass it to um, over to Adnan. Adnan, please. Thank you very much, Maran, and uh, good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to uh, to join you all. So, so my name is Adnan Sharif. I'm a uh, kidney uh, and transplant doctor. Um, I work in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Birmingham. Um, and I've, I've had a long association with given kidney. I was originally part of the steering committee and um, providing um, kind of leadership from a nephrology point of view. And then very recently, I've joined as a, as a trustee. And part of the reason for that is, I mean, as, as a transplant doctor, you, um, you, know, you do become interested in organ donation um, because you know, you, we can't achieve transplantation without having a sufficient number of organs to be able to transplant into individuals. So I think it's always natural to think about organ donation and transplantation as kind of two um, sides of the same coin. So, um, so I've always had an interest in trying to encourage living donation, to try and encourage uh, deceased donation. And one of the reasons for that is something which uh, Greg touched upon um, that, you know, unfortunately there is a shortage in uh, the number of organs to achieve the number of transplants that we need. And I think whenever there's a gap in that kind of supply versus demand, unfortunately there will always be people who try to exploit that for financial uh, gain. And unfortunately, illegal and unethical organ trafficking, transplant tourism is a, is a major part of, um, you know, transplantation that happens around the world. And it's, you know, as mentioned, it happens behind kind of dark corners, happens in secret, so it's very hard to know exactly what numbers we're talking about. But the World Health Organization a few decades ago estimated that maybe it was about 10 to 15 percent of all the transplants that happen around the world. And it's always suggested that the best way to try and stamp this out is to try and encourage countries to become self-sufficient in um, their kind of demand for organs and the need for transplantation. And so, you know, I've been involved with um, an organization called Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting because I've always had a, a real interest um, in this area. And that interest arose, um, funnily enough, as I was discussing um, different ways to kind of encourage organ donation and, and you know, ways to encourage people to donate organs after they, after they die. And as part of that conversation, I was chatting to one of um, uh, my colleagues in Israel, where they have a slightly uh, different organ donation system. And as part of those conversations, um, he mentioned to me whether I'd be happy to sign a petition. Now, you know, I've been aware about organ trafficking in a number of countries and I've been involved with a number of documentaries. Um, and you know, there's lots of examples of countries, predominantly in Asia and Africa, where um, organ trafficking happens by individuals, by gangs. Um, but what I wasn't prepared for was what occurs in one particular country and what this particular petition was dealing with. Um, and that country is China. And what this petition, which was being sent to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, was for an independent investigation with regards to what happens in China. Now, you know, we talk about transplant tourism, illegal um, organ trafficking, forced organ harvesting. But when you really focus on something like forced organ harvesting, then the situation in China is, is absolutely unique. 
Um, and it's at a different level when it comes to thinking about you know, what is unethical when it comes to organ donation and transplantation. And the allegations um, that have persisted in China has been that most of their organ supply comes from executed prisoners. Now, these are prisoners who may have committed capital crimes, but they are often prisoners of conscience. So these are people who are imprisoned based on their faith, based on their beliefs, uh, based on the fact that they are deemed to be a, a risk um, to, to politicians. Now, these claims have always been there um, and for, for many decades, there was a, um, a belief outside of China that the vast majority of organs um, that are used for transplantation in China come from these executed prisoners, which is always denied. And it was only before the Beijing Olympics, which was in 2006, that the, um, the Chinese accepted that the majority of their organs do come from executed prisoners. And the figure that they quoted at that time was over 90% of organ donors come from executed prisoners. Now, China has always denied that they take organs from prisoners of conscience, and they've always said that these are um, capital prisoners who've been sentenced to death row, who get asked for their consent to donate organs um, after they've been executed. Now, they said that they were trying to wean themselves off, um, and what we've been told by the Chinese authorities is that as of January 2015, they no longer use um, executed prisoners and they have a completely ethical, voluntary organ donation system now in China. Now, the difficulty that we have is that it's very difficult to verify these findings. Um, and the figures that are produced are not transparent, like you see in countries like you know, UK, uh, the USA, across Europe, where there's organ donation registries, transplant registries, and you can verify numbers. That doesn't exist in China. And there's been lots of claims and lots of allegations that there's still um, forced organ harvesting that happens. Um, there's certain sections of the community who are targeted. Um, previously, it's always been Falun Gong practitioners, which is a kind of a religious group that emerged in the 1960s. More recently, there's been um, allegations against other sections um, of the Chinese society, such as Uyghur Muslims. Now, there's been a number of tribunals, independent tribunals, which have been uh, led by a, a top um, British barrister Sir Geoffrey Nice. He was involved with the um, the war crimes tribunal against um, the former Yugoslavia and led the the prosecution against Slobodan Milosevic. And he conducted two tribunals: the China Tribunal, which uh, released its report in 2020, and the Uyghur Tribunal, which released its report in 2021. And both of them are available online, um, and all the evidence that they collected is all available to uh, to view. And what they both agreed with was that there is a nationwide state-sanctioned system of forced organ harvesting, which essentially um, takes, steals organs from individuals who are executed on demand to supply organs, not just for a domestic market, but also unfortunately for an international market for people who are willing to buy organs. And the way the system works is, for example, currently with perhaps over a million Uyghur Muslims incarcerated um, in concentration camps, is that if you are in need of a heart or liver transplant and you live abroad, you go on to um, certain websites, which are usually available, but then get taken down um, very, very quickly as soon as they realize that um, they've been caught. But you put in your details, you put in your arrival date, um, and you will be allocated a date a few weeks in advance for your heart transplant, your lung transplant, liver or kidney. Now, a kidney transplant can be planned weeks and months in advance with the benefit of living donation, but you can't plan a heart, lung or liver transplant unless you have a living uh, live donor, unless you know that someone's going to be dying on a certain day. And essentially, if people do go onto these websites and buy themselves one of these organs, that's essentially a death warrant for someone who's been incarcerated. Now, there's a big campaign to try and stop this practice. There's been a lot of uh, pressure from um, professional societies. Um, some have really led the way, such as the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. Um, others have not been 
quite as supportive. And some believe that China has completely changed the practice and now um, is completely uh, ethical. But there's no way to verify that. There's no independent review and there's been no independent investigation for this. Um, and recently, kind of a human rights law group, the Global Rights Compliance, have suggested that you know, we need to be careful that we're not complicit in illegal and unethical practice by supporting Chinese academia and Chinese institutions uh, with kind of knowledge or academic exchange, which could directly or indirectly be facilitating illegal and um, forced organ harvesting. So, you know, this is you know, a, a major issue with regards to um, unethical organ donation and transplantation. China is not alone. As I mentioned, there are other countries in Africa and Asia who do sub, um, do engage in um, forced organ harvesting or illegal activity or unethical um, organ trafficking. But what happens in China, I think, is, is completely different because it's, it's state sanctioned and we believe it's supported um, by military hospitals and provides a sufficient amount of resource um, for a lot of those um, individuals and hospitals and, and the military in China. So I think the important thing that we can do outside of China is to kind of raise awareness of this. And um, at the time before this petition, I wasn't even aware um, that these things happened. And even when you read into it, you sometimes feel that this simply can't be possible um, in the 21st century that you know this happens. And in fact, both the China and the Uyghur tribunal, they stopped short for calling um, what was happening in China genocide. And there's very strict legal terminology to be able to call um, something a genocide. But they did say that this was an example of crimes against humanity. And in fact, the um, United Nations um, Special Rapporteurs also released a report last year, which um, was sent to China, essentially saying that they have um, very strong evidence that forced organ harvesting is happening. It's happening in vulnerable sections of uh, the Chinese community, such as Uyghur Muslims or Falun Gong practitioners, and asking for an independent investigation, which again has never happened. To date, all these allegations are always denied, um, but I think the, the volume of evidence which is there, um, in, my, in my opinion, um, really is irrefutable. And often what is mentioned is that there's no smoking gun, there's no hard evidence, and it's very difficult to get um, a smoking gun in a very closed, secretive society. And so from my perspective, it's, you know, I think it's really important to raise awareness of it. Um, but it also indirectly shows the importance for countries to become very self-sufficient um, in their own organ donor supply to stop this kind of international flow um, of transplant tourists who may feel out of desperation that they need to go abroad um, and buy, buy an organ. Um, and that's why I think encouraging living donation, encouraging uh, deceased donation is really, really important. I'll be happy to kind of answer any questions uh, later. And it's my pleasure to kind of hand over to Antonia to, uh, to finish off the talks. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Adnan. Thank you to Jan to Bob for inviting me to take part in this. So I'm Antonia Cronin. I'm a consultant nephrologist at Guy's and St Thomas's uh, Hospital in London. And I'm also um, work at King's College London as a, um, a reader in medical ethics and law. Um, I suppose I want to think about my interest in organ donation and transplantation ethics is related to the way in which it's such a remarkably successful enterprise because of transplant practice, transplant skill that has become highly evolved. And I'm very interested in its relation with ethical and legal frameworks and social policy. And it always interests me to go back to the basis upon which the enterprise of transplantation began um, with a sort of social policy contract and Richard Titmuss's book, The Gift Relationship, emphasises the importance of altruism in the domain of organ donation and transplantation, though that book was originally written about blood donations. But it is interesting, and as all three other speakers have alluded to, um, to think about how altruism is a motivation and a practice and how it shouldn't in a way surprise us that when something as successful as transplantation 
has become it's almost become a victim of its own success based on this kind of way of thinking and of course as Adnand and Mira Nangregov said demand has well and truly outstripped supply, uh, supply of organs for transplantation so in a way this is how uh, systems have evolved that have become and become to involve potentially exploitation and coercion as the others have alluded to. This is something that has evolved historically through transplantation and is also happening contemporaneously as we've seen this evening. I don't want to go over what the others have said but one area that I, two areas actually that I want to focus in on a little bit this evening is first of all equitable access to organs and the opportunity to have access to an organ it's really strikes me as hugely concerning that even though in the UK we have a highly evolved living donor uh, transplantation, kidney transplantation system at least, um, along with non-directed altruistic donations, directed donations, a highly evolved UK kidney sharing scheme, we still have extraordinary disparities in the equitable access to living organ donation particularly for black and minority ethnic groups and certain other demographics, including individuals who lack decision-making capacity. And I'm really struck by the rawness of the data that is with us here today um, at how even though individuals from black and minority ethnic groups are often overrepresented on the transplant waiting list, they are remaining to be underrepresented on the donor pool, and they continue to have lower rates of transplantation in both living donation and also deceased donation. And for me, this is one area that we need to address and we need to address it urgently and understand the reasons for it and the barriers why this is happening. Because I think if we can get underneath understanding why there are these barriers, it might help us to understand why people pursue other ways of obtaining transplants. The second thing that I want to bring into focus is solutions that draw away from the issue of shortage and demand and supply issues. And that is to think through on the horizon scanning, xenotransplantation and regenerative medicine solutions for transplantation. And I think xenotransplantation offers us something that is coming very much back in vogue. The science has evolved hugely. In the early 2000s in the UK, we had a regulatory authority, an interim regulatory authority called the UK UCIRA, that's UK Xenotransplant Interim Regulatory Authority, that was charged with oversight, operational oversight of xenotransplantation. At the time, um, any sort of advancement, if you like, in xenotransplantation came to an abrupt halt because of concern about porcine endogenous retroviruses, um, which was infections that could be transmitted. I think now we have evolved science that has been ongoing, particularly in North America, uh, to circumvent issues related to endogenous retroviruses and also issues related to hyperacute rejection which was uh, always previously thought to be the main issue with um, xenogenic transplants and earlier well last year in fact in the states there's been a degree of success with um, xenotransplantation into humans of, of kidneys and heart. I think thinking through the ethical issues and legal and regulatory issues related to that and how we might implement on a practical level these kind of transports in the UK could provide us with a solution that overcomes the shortage of organs um, and may provide a satisfactory solution to it completely. Regenerative medicine I think is also hugely important thinking about, for example, a bioartificial pancreas to cure type 1 diabetes. This will almost inevitably also include cells from xenogenic sources. And so I think as a society, we need to have a better, fuller understanding 
of the complexity of these products, how we're going to, the donor sources, the acquisition of the products, and how we're going to think about the complexity of production, patient selection for use of these products for first in man trials, and thinking forward about how we should evolve and develop policy in this domain if we as a society think this is a good thing to, uh, to pursue. So I'm going to leave it there uh, because I'm really keen to have discussion with the audience and with the, my other speakers, but they are the two areas that for me right now are key issues that I've been thinking about and I think uh, as, as a society we need to be thinking about and as a transplant community we need to be thinking about to take forward um, the enterprise that we know is so successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all four of you. I think you've already, Ray, I've got lots of questions buzzing in my head already. I, I, I just wondered for the sake of um, perhaps Antonio, for the sake of people who are less familiar with the world of transplantation, whether you could just just give a little bit of an example of Xeno trans a definition of Xeno transplantation for those who might that might be a term that they're not familiar with. Absolutely. Sorry, Thank I you. should have done That's that. That's okay. Before. No, of course. So Thank you. Normally when we talk about um, uh, grafts or transplants, we talk about either allografts, which is usually uh, from one human to another human, so a human kidney into a human transplant recipient. A xenotransplant is when you take uh, a, an organ, perhaps a kidney, from another another mammal, and usually pigs, and you transplant that into a, a human. So it's going from one species to another. Thank you so much. That was just for the benefit of anyone who was unfamiliar with the, with the term. So, so as I said earlier, um, for those of you who may have joined a little bit later, the Q and A function is available for anybody listening live today. Um, so please do uh, type into the Q&A box any questions that you have for our panelists today. But, but before we kind of take any of those questions, um, I wondered if any of you, I mean, so many issues raised about, you know, consent, what does it mean to consent, the meaning of consent about, you know, the nature of the market and the, the, the possibility of, um exploit obviously of exploitation in any any market uh, so many so many issues and and possibilities of you know what technology may allow and science may allow transplantation to develop into into the future so i wondered if any of you uh, today wanted to respond to anybody else before we kind of uh, get into any more questions i think uh diff very different pers perspectives potentially today I mean, I mean, I'm, I mean, I found all the all the kind of talks fascinating because uh, I mean, you you can each one of them. I think you can easily just spend an hour and a half um, kind of just debating the uh, kind of the, you know the pros and cons. Uh, I mean, uh, for example, the uh, the one about the market, um, Miran. I mean, I've, it, I, there's been a few a few conferences. I think the British Transplantation Society has had it a couple of times, but certainly some of the other ones where there's always a debate, you know, the, something whenever they want to kind of spice things up, they'll have a debate session where you'll have two people debating whether you should be allowed to uh, to sell an organ. And they, oh yeah, every time they do a vote on it, it always gets voted down, and people always get kind of very emotional and will say, well, you know, what price would you put on a kidney or this that? Um, but I mean, obviously, there are examples. Um, I mean, Iran, I think, is probably the the main example where they do have a kind of a a regulated system, and um, I've I've seen them present their um, their work at conferences, and they, I mean, they, it's amazingly transparent when they talk about how they brought it in and why they brought it in, mainly because they realised that there was kind of unethical practices going on, and they knew there was a black market, and they were trying to step in to um, to essentially regulate it. Um, I mean, w what's your view on the um, kind of the, the Iranian system because I think there's certainly some good things but and they're very transparent about the the negative aspects of, of their system as well um, well um, first of all I think we we need to acknowledge that the market has the capacity to wipe out the waiting list in two and a half seconds. 
Okay, I, whatever we think about trade in organs, we need to acknowledge that there are, in principle, um, let's say two and a half billion potential vendors, and only what half a million per year of you know people patients on waiting lists, something like that, perhaps a million worldwide. I mean, the supply in principle, which the market could meet, um, is, is uh, uh, outweighs by far the demand. Uh, this, uh, uh, so in, in this regard, I mean, we need to acknowledge that the market can do it, okay? The question I think we should ask ourselves is whether we want to live in a society in which people even consider the possibility of selling their body parts, okay? I personally wouldn't wish to live in such a society. Uh, the point I'm making, I, I, I'm against organ, uh, against trade in organs, personally. I'm against trade in organs, not because I think there is something kind of, you know, essentially problematic in doing that. I don't think there is anything problematic in selling one's organs or buying somebody's organs. I don't think there is any problem with someone or people having to sleep under the bridge or begging on the streets or doing, you know, whatever, urinating on the streets. You know, if you have to sell your organs, you have to sell your organs. The question is, do we want to live in a society where people find themselves in situations, are forced to consider even selling their organs? And the answer is no. So the point is that uh, I'm, I'm trying to make is that criticism against selling organs can only make sense if you criticize at the same time also the conditions that force people to consider selling organs, okay? Otherwise, it makes no sense, okay? So, yes, it works in, in, uh, in, in Iran, but I think, you know, Iran is not, is not you, know, you know, kind of a moral lighthouse, in general, that we can, you know, use as, a, as an example or something like that, uh, really. Uh, but I would like to, you know, provoke you, Adnan, if I may. Um, in 2011, I was one of the first people who raised the issue of um, forced uh, organ donation from executed prisoners in the context of China via a letter sent with this Israeli, uh, signed also by this Israeli colleague you uh, did not mention by name, published at the Lancet. Uh, but a very short time after signing this letter and publishing this letter, I started, uh, you know, I, I developed some interest in the validity of um, the data that um, you and your colleagues uh, were presenting. And I must say that I have become increasingly suspicious that, I, I mean, I, I, I want to presume, I really, and I do presume that there is no, uh, um, uh, no, uh, uh, th that there is something in what you're saying, that uh, the Chinese, uh, that in China, in China, there have been a lot, I don't know how many, you don't know how many, a lot of cases of uh, forced uh, or not forced or, you know, simply, taking organs from prisoners with, without consent, and so on. I found it hard to believe uh, that this is uh, a state-sanctioned um, practice. Uh, more like local corruption on various levels, but state-sanctioned 
you know, kind of policy, I found it hard to believe. Later on, uh, I was compelled to put this whole question in a much bigger context because it's not, the Chinese are not doing just this. They are doing everything. Everything that is evil is connected to China. I mean, there is a yellow danger. I mean, I'm obviously kind of, you know, making um, uh, uh, some irony out of this. The point is that I fear that regardless of whatever data come out uh, from China about such practices, that there is a bigger context here, and this is a Cold War against China. And we need to be wary of this and take this evidence, you know, even you, you say there is no smoking gun, uh, this is my opinion, uh, data, so on. It's a very small group of militants. I'm familiar with many of them, uh, you know, and, and uh, which uh, who, who are now seem to be looking for any opportunity to, uh, to have a go at China, okay? Uh, everybody is against China. China is now the bad guy, okay? Uh, I think we, particularly as doctors, should be very, very careful when we, you know, involve ourselves in, in these matters. I mean, I'll, I'll quickly respond because I think it'll, uh, it'll take up the entire time that we have left. Um, yeah, no. So, I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, it, I mean, I find it kind of very hard to believe most of these allegations. And it's true. It's very hard to get any hard figures for, for anything. Um, I mean, the one thing which I am aware of, I mean, last year, the BMJ asked for, say, a, a head-to-head debate article um, where they asked me to argue that we should stop accepting transplantation research um, submissions from China. And they were going to ask for a rival um, article, and it was going to be a debate thing. Um, Twelve months later, the BMJ could not could not find a single professional from China, um, from the Transplantation Society, which has been very supportive of the official position, um, and a number of individuals who are usually very supportive to argue the other side at all. So they in the, ended up just publishing my article by itself. Um, and you're right, it's very hard to get any data, it's very hard to get any figures, it's very, you know, most of these are claims, the allegations, and there is no absolute hard evidence. What evidence is available is on these tribunal websites, which people are welcome to have a little look at. Um, but the fact that there's a complete lack of engagement, um, and there's good evidence, which again is published, um, of the data manipulation that goes on, in their registry data, which has got nothing to do with what questions you know other people have raised, it's data which has been published um, from China. I think, in my eyes, I think it's very hard to say that there's you know there's no um, you know no smoke without fire. But I think it really is up to them to uh, say, well, actually, look, hold on, these are all just wild allegations. Here you are. Here's you know, feel free to kind of come inspect, do whatever you want, which has never happened. That's that's never, ever happened. Um, and it would be wonderful to be able to kind of engage as peers. I mean, transplantation is, um, you know, there's so much exchange that happens, not just within the UK, um, it happens across Europe, happens across the world. People go to different places to train. I myself you know, went over to the state to do some of my training and that's, that's transplantation. You know, we love to go and get a different aspect, um, but there's real danger when you're working with a country um, where the allegations are so overwhelming that unethical practice is happening. Thank you, Bert. I'll interject because I think you're right. This is probably a discussion that we could spend hours and hours having. So I think with great respect and really interested to hear both your views on that. But there's some questions coming in around um, around social media, Greg, 
uh, so if, if you're okay for me to bring you back in on those. So one question around, you can probably see them, but about the distinction, is there a distinction and blurred line between promoting and raising awareness or encouragement as, as that was another word that I think Adnan used earlier. Um, and a question about actually, would it be helpful perhaps for um, there to be resources available created maybe by Give a Kidney or, or NHSBT or, uh, to help people who are thinking of uh, asking for a living donor or um, yeah, looking for somebody to donate. Um, about the do's and don'ts and um, potentially uh, reduce the negative impact on those people who are seeking the organ and uh, making them aware of the pitfalls, et cetera. Do you have any views on that, Greg? Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, I suppose that in answer to the first question, I would accept that there is probably a blurred line between um, raising awareness and promoting uh, non-directed living donation. Uh, I think the distinction that is generally made is that raising awareness uh, aims to yeah, make people who may naturally be inclined towards uh, donating aware of it, giving them the option, uh, but not effectively creating new donors. Uh, it's about um, giving the option to people who would already be inclined to donate if they were aware of it. Whereas in terms of promoting it, it's more about being persuasive uh, trying to actually encourage people who otherwise uh, simply would maybe never have considered um, donating and convincing them that it's the right thing to do. Um, I think ethically we, we have to accept that there is a blurred line there. Um, I, I think that it's for me it's an open question about whether promotion of, um, of non-directed uh, donation is ethically acceptable. Um, I, th I think that there is a, a genuine debate to be had there. Uh, I think that increasingly we're seeing more acceptance within the transplant community of, of non-directed donation. Uh, I think that it's living donation generally is becoming more normalized. Uh, we're seeing, I think over the last few decades, we've seen living donation change from being a last resort to gold standard treatment. Um, I, th I think the, the sort of ethical boundaries have already been crossed to some extent. Uh, so I think that as a, as a transplant community, I think that the, the discussion needs to be had about how far we'd now go in terms of trying to increase rates of living donation. Uh, is there a limit to how far we should push? Uh, and yeah, I, I can see that Antonia's got her hand up. So I'd be really interested to hear her perspective as someone who is working with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, thanks, um, Greg. I, I think the questions are really interesting and, and, and so to your response. If you, I suppose, do you think, I mean, we have lots of promotion for organ transplantation. We have transplant cards. Um, there are vans that go around saying give blood uh donate blood do you think we shouldn't really decipher a difference between living donation and other forms of donation do you think we should be is it more acceptable to be thinking about it as you know a donation more broadly should we include in that an acceptance of other potential forms of donation as well do you see what i mean yeah, I, I, I see exactly what you mean. I think that the distinction that I would draw, and I, I accept it's not a hard and fast distinction, is the, the increased risks associated with living organ donation. So donating a kidney is riskier than donating blood, for instance. It's a more involved procedure. Uh, and although I think that, I mean, I guess there's, there's, there are discussions to be had about the extent to which promotion starts to potentially become manipulative and things like that. And it's not necessarily the case that promoting something is manipulative. But if we start to imagine, um, like, I don't know, big national advertising campaigns trying to encourage people to, to become living donors, I think we could start to see the situation changed into one where there are subtle pressures on people to donate people who are genu generally um who want to be perceived as, as helping other people may feel pressures to to donate i think that once you start to increase the level of promotion you start to increase these subtle pressures and i think it it's not necessarily problematic i think there's an empirical question um, there, but I think that once promotion starts to 
become more than just awareness raising. And once you're actually starting to try to convince people to donate, uh, then the landscape changes a bit. Now, I, I completely take your point about the fact that we we already um, promote some forms of giving. So things like um, charitable financial giving. Um, absolutely, charities advertise uh, to try to con convince people to donate. We see adverts for charities which are heartrending things designed to almost manipulate people into donating. They make you feel guilty about not donating. Would it be okay to do the same for kidney donation? Uh, would we want to see uh, videos or would we think it was okay to see videos on TV of uh, patients desperately waiting for a kidney transplant? Um, I don't know. I think that once it starts to go down that sort of em almost emotionally manipulative um, avenue, then it starts to become more problematic. Uh, I think that there was a, a campaign in Scotland in relation to deceased donation a few years ago, which did go down those, those sorts of lines and that caused a lot, lot of controversy at the time. I think if it was done in relation to living donation, we'd probably see more controversy. I mean, something being controversial doesn't mean that it's not right, of course. So uh, I'm, I'm open to being convinced on these things. Sorry, that was a garbled answer to a very straightforward question. So do you think that there should be um, a greater emphasis, therefore, on sourcing, on, on, on the acquisition of organs or cellular products uh, as solutions to organ failure as a priority? Should, should those be prioritised? I mean, do you think, from what you're saying, is it, a, is it a logical conclusion to that, that you're suggesting that there may be circumstances in which we might become to think of living donation as barbaric? I would... I would do more to promote deceased donation. Uh, I think that there are gains to be made in deceased donation still, which are unrealized. Uh, I think that the deceased donation framework could be changed somewhat uh, to increase rates of donation. Uh, I would rather see that happen than um, increased efforts to dip into uh, a bigger living donation pool. And so if you were promoting, if you were wanting to pursue that, would you be endorsing the sorts of campaigns that NHSBT, uh, for example, the Welsh campaign of advertising when back in 2015, when deceased donation in Wales became an opt out system? Obviously, it was slightly blighted in the England and, and Northern Ireland yeah. because of, of, of COVID. But at the time in Wales, it was a highly successful advertising campaign, for example, adverts at bus stops and so forth. Is that the sort of thing that you think is legitimately? For, for deceased donation, absolutely. There are no risks associated with deceased donation. It's risk free. It's win win. You, you can dramatically improve people's lives at zero cost to yourself. We should be hammering home this message, uh, doing everything we can to, to create a sense of duty when it comes to deceased donation. Um, it seems straightforward to me um, and I know that there, there are benefits associated with, with having organs from living donors and I don't want to downplay those but uh, I do think that good outcomes can obviously be achieved with, with good deceased donors too and that we should pursue that before we expose healthy people to a risk of harm. And would that include mandating it? Um, I would and maybe fall short of, I think politically it's, it's difficult to, to endorse mandating it, but I wouldn't have any strong objections to um, a system with a bit more bite. So if you opt out of donating, you opt out from receiving a transplant. Um, I think there's a sense in which that type of system is fundamentally fair. Um, and I think that um, we could, uh, my, my ideal way of doing this would be that actually we ask people whether they would want to receive a transplant or not, uh, rather than asking people whether they want to be an organ donor or not. If you want to receive a transplant in future, if you have a need one, your organs are automatically donated. Uh, change the question around like that. And I think that you overcome some of the ethical obstacles that have been raised in the past. Could I bring Merrin in, please? I can see that you're keen to... Yes. Uh, Greg, you uh, suggested, uh, actually asserted, that there is no risk in opt-out uh, deceased donation. I would like to, uh, uh, I, I would uh, beg to differ. Um, uh, what is opt-out consent? 
if not a legal fiction, which is based on the fictitious presumption that if you didn't say no, you would have said yes. Um, uh, it is fictitious because it's not, there's nothing logical in it. And also in practice, we know that there are populations who would not in any way, you know, liaise with the system, hear what the system has to say, give consent to anything, you know, asked from them by the system, which an opt-out system takes advantage of. I mean, uh, and these are the most vulnerable people in this country. Okay, and many in many other countries. Now, an opt-out disease donation would be, in my opinion, completely moral if it followed a serious, meaningful, deep public discussion. But this is not the case. Okay, this is not the case. I mean, there is an attempt here, an obvious attempt to use the opt-out system to capitalize on those who wouldn't, who would say, who would have said no, uh, no if they had been forced to express their opinion. So I, I agree with that. And I have actually published um, arguing that, yeah, the implementing opt-out during the COVID pandemic was likely to be a catastrophically bad time to do it. But I think if we're talking about fictions, we also need to be very clear that the risk is zero disease donation when it comes to opt-in, opt-out, anything, because the person is dead. You cannot harm a dead person. You cannot wrong a dead person. It's a fiction to say that you can. It's philosophically incoherent. We should be clear about that. It's pretty much undebatable unless you can come up with a way of defending posthumous harms, which seems implausible to me. So I think if we're going to talk about fictions, it's that fiction that we should address because it's wrong. You are taking organs from people, yes, dead people. You're not harming them, yes. Notwithstanding their effective, if not explicit, refusal. Okay, this is bad enough, isn't it? Bad for whom? Oh, okay. I leave it at that. But there's no answer to that question. because No, 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 I disagree. I disagree. It's like, you know, um, uh, uh, someone um, wrote a will, you know, a, and you you don't respect the will, okay? I, I think I think it's betrayal of trust in living people. It's not about dead people. You are betraying the trust. You are making uh, you are making the system less trustworthy for people who are still alive via an opt out system. This is the risk here. So, is a mandated system more attractive to you than Mirren? If, no. if, if, if it's a system where if it applies to one, it applies to all in that regard, is that more attractive to you? I mean, obviously, NHS blood and transplant do function with an opt-out register and an opt-in register. So to that extent, there is the opportunity for individuals if they do not wish to be a deceased donor in the event of their death. That's a possibility. Does a uh, system of compulsory donation satisfy your concern that you've just raised? I have nothing against and nothing for compulsory donation in principle. It all depends on the context. Compulsory uh, a donation would be perfectly fine if it followed a serious democratic process, a serious public discussion. But this is not the case in our society. It's not the case. I mean, it does. it's not the result of a serious discussion. I mean, it's a... It's a bottom-down or top-down uh, decision, essentially, with a constructive notice. I mean, yeah, something, there is a, 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 a message in a newspaper or in, in you know, in, on the internet somewhere, you know, that says, if you decline, if you refuse, you know, just tell us, tell us in advance. 
Okay. But, I mean, we do have a, a soft opt-out system. So family will still be consulted, given the opportunity to provide evidence that the person's recorded wishes do not reflect their, their actual wishes. So does that not safeguard against the concern that you're, you're raising? I don't think so. I'm not so much interested in, 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 in um, substitutive judgment or, you know, surrogate judgment or decision of, you know, uh, uh, family relatives. I think it's a legal fiction as well. I mean, the idea that uh, the family represents the will and the interests of the person themselves, I mean, is also fictitious. Uh, but it's definitely you know, better than, you know, without it. Uh, no, it doesn't appease me. Because, because even, even then, even then there is some percentage of, of, you know, kind of, of manipulation. Some, a, a, a bit of manipulation that is going on. And I think that this is the reason why we have an opt-out consent. Okay. It's really, it's, it's not simply, you know, to increase numbers. It's to capitalize on those who would have said no, but didn't. Adnan, I can see you wanting yeah, to... Yeah, I, I just, yeah. I was a, it's a fascinating um, discussion. And I just wanted to kind of uh, to add it. I mean, I've, so I've never been a fan of opt-out, presumed consent, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I'm Welsh by birth, so uh, I was championing kind of, you know, the change in Wales, and clearly it made some difference to concentrate rates and things. Um, but my personal thing, and it's as, you know, everyone's mentioned, I don't think changing the legislation makes any difference because you still have to ask for next of kin consent. Um, and we published something where we compared the uh, opt-in and opt-out countries within the OECD. And all you find is that there's actually no difference in donation rates when you compare opt-in to opt-out. The only difference is actually you get less living donors in opt-out countries. Um, and the biggest fallacy is always when people assume that Spain is you know, a world leader because of opt-out. It's not a world leader because of opt-out. I mean, there is no opt-out register in Spain. It's a leader because it you know, promotes organ donation and it's really kind of within the fabric um, of kind of almost like Spanish society. But I guess my wh one question is maybe to it, Mirren. I mean, the, um, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, I, I completely get your position about, um, you know, respecting the living. So I guess, you know, the one thing which always frustrates me is that, you know, every year in NHSBT's report, they always mention there's probably about 80 90 occasions where people have opted into the register during life, but then the family overrule their loved one's wishes. Um, and you know, there's never been a case where that organ donation has still been facilitated, despite the fact that they, you know, the family are overriding their loved one's wishes. Um, I mean, what would you feel about that? I mean, do you think you know we should be forcing through to say, well, we're really you know, we don't wish to kind of um, you know, make this distressing situation even more distressing for you, but we are going to honour your loved one's wishes and, you know, take them for organ donation. Again, I would put it in a bigger context. Um, it's not an, a yes or no, a, a pro or con uh, thing. It's the context. Um, uh, if we... We need, we need to strive for consent, uh, consent and consensus. Um, uh, and when we don't have the consent, we don't have the trust. We don't have the trust. We don't have the business. I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, um, what we need to make sure is that the system makes everything it can in order to make itself trustworthy. And if it is trustworthy, and if it is genuinely patient-centered, not business-centered, not organ-centered, but patient-centered, okay, uh, then the public will respond. Not immediately necessarily, but in time, the public will respond. And this is what I want to see. You know, kind of, you know, a, a public that works together with the system because it knows that the system is its system. 
I mean, I agree with you that different laws don't make better systems. And I think that's why um, Adnan's review of the opt-out, opt-in legislative frameworks and related to numbers doesn't really make much difference. I disagree with the point that the opt-out uh, countries are, have a lower rate of living donation because, of course, England and Wales and uh, Northern Ireland are a very good example of that now, Adnan, that has a highly evolved living donor system. But... Do you think, going back to my issue, at least one of them that I raised, about inequitable access to organs and in specifically related to black and minority ethnic groups, I wanted to draw out on your point about trust within the system that you're describing. Um, because Gert Randawa, who I'm sure you're familiar with Gert's work, who's a professor of public uh, diversity at uh, Bedford, has raised this issue numerous times about the issue of trust within a system, particularly for people, um, mostly Southeast Asians in actual fact. And I want to know your thoughts on that. Do you, is it your view that a lack of trust could be potentially greater in minority ethnic groups and, or, or certain groups? Are we missing are we missing uh, identifying through our systems some of those groups? Should we be doing more work to help uh, donation rates and transplantation rates in those groups? I presume so. I presume so. If, if the system betrays the particular interest of a particular group, okay, then this group is likely in time to lose trust in the system. But what do you mean betray? Um, like you said, not uh, 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 provide uh, or distribute organs in an inequitable way. Ah, oh, but it's not necessarily distributing them in an equitable way. It's about the opportunity of access to them. It's Isn't not that, necessarily that, about the allocation of, or distribution of organs. There uh, are good oh. and proper reasons to... Okay, but, it, but, but it's, it's, it's basically the same, I think. I think uh, the, the fact is that there are groups who do not receive the treatment they should receive. So just to be clear on this, if you take the deceased donor transplant waiting list, which is, of course, as you know, is a national deceased donor transplant waiting list in the UK, um, it's been well documented for at least since 2008 that um, members of the public from from black and minority ethnic groups are underrepresented on the deceased donor pool. However, they are overrepresented on the national transplant waiting list. My question to you is given your concerns about the system, and I, I, I understand your concerns, I'm wondering whether or not um, systematically we're getting it wrong for these people. And does that explain to us why there are fewer people from these groups registered on the national waiting list and, and what would be your solution to try and address this this issue has been going on for a long time it's not peculiar to deceased donation no. as i said in my brief synopsis of a, of a couple of things that for me are an issue right now it's also a, an issue in living donation too yeah i'm not sure I'm not sure. I mean, but I, I think it's obvious that there is something systemically wrong and this fundamental thing needs to be, to be tackled. Um, okay, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, of course, it involves um, cultural differences, but it also involves socioeconomic, particularly economic differences, economic discrimination, um, uh, all these things need to be tackled in order to eventually kind of, you know, balance, you know, all groups and bring them together. Uh, but so when you say socioeconomic discrimination, is it your assertion that if you're poorer, you, you are less likely to get an organ? Is that what you're suggesting? It, it, it is possible. It's definitely possible. Yeah. Could I interject now, just because I'm aware of time? I mean, again, a really fascinating. I mean, I, I'm aware that NHSBT is, and many members of the clinical community are involved in research around, you know, equity of access, you know, all the work that goes into the allocation scheme to try to make it as fair as possible. Again, it's something we could discuss and discuss. I think that's probably for another webinar. Um, 
so much so much content today there's there's one question that i did kind of want to get to um just before we finish which was i mean there is a policy in place about this question it's from bonnie about any whether any of you have any views on um the system of prioritizing potential or li actual living kidney donors for example if a donor uh, a living donor donates a kidney should they be given priority on the transplant waiting list if they ever require one in the future? Obviously, there is a policy on that. I'm curious to know very briefly, probably, if anybody has any views on that that they'd like to add. Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, I, I fully support that policy. I think that really this is what we, we owe to living donors. I think if they need a transplant as a consequence of being pre of having previously donated, uh, then yeah, this is what, what should be done uh, to put them back on a level playing field, essentially. Sorry, I've got a, a slightly uh, gripey baby, uh, so I'll go back on mute. Yeah, no, I mean, just to echo that, I mean, there's obviously already a policy in the UK, and I, don't, you know, I think you know, it will have, you know, consensus amongst everyone that that's a sensible um sensible strategy and approach um and uh, you know i think there's many countries who have established organ donation systems that have, you know, have a similar policy and it's clearly the right thing to do and i completely concur and as bonnie will know there's uh, even court cases about it so um they're highly highly evolved and yes very necessary policy Well, thank you. Given the time, I think we probably do need to draw draw to a close today. But I just want to once again express my very sincere thanks to all four of you for the very, I mean, yeah, thought provocative, challenging, lively debate. Um, it's certainly given me lots of food for thought, and that's certainly the case for the people listening in today. So thank you all for joining us. Um, before we uh, log off today, I just wanted to kind of flag. Um, a couple more things um, to those of you who are joining live um, about our next webinar, which will take place on March the 18th, which I think is a Saturday. Um, and this webinar is a, going to be a back to basics um, panel discussion about living kidney donation. So this is aimed at people who are very new to the idea of living donation, don't really know any of the terms, any of the jargon, don't really know what it involves. Um, so we'll be going really, really back basic Adnan, I think you're joining us for, for that one as well. We'll be joined by a surgeon um, and a living donor coordinator. So um, do uh, the, all the information is on, on our website and social media channels. So if you're interested in joining us for that, then please do. Um, the other thing I wanted to kind of flag this year, forgive a kidney, it's a special year we're expecting within the next few weeks, possibly a few months, uh, to hit the 1,000 non-directed living kidney donation in the UK, which I believe um, some of you may beg to differ, but I believe is a, a great cause for celebration. Um, and we will be celebrating that in a number of ways. So um, do follow us on our channels to find out what we're up to. One of the things that uh, we have planned already with one of our supporters, Dennis, I think you may be listening in, um, is uh, a, a long distance cycle ride from starting it in Edinburgh, going to Oxford in September. And that will be calling at um, seven or eight transplant centres en route. Um, and it's called the Transplant Four. So if anybody's keen cyclist and wants to join them, please do. Um, the last thing to say is thank you all for joining us. Obviously, um, once again to our speakers, 